This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Um, so we're very lucky to have uh, Tessa Lau and Alan Seifer, both from IBM Almaden. Uh, Tessa got her PhD recently in 2001 from uh, UW, right, from University of Washington. Um, Alan got his PhD back in 1980 from Yale. Uh, Tessa's mostly focused on work in the productivity and creativity areas, trying to uh, imp you know, improve productivity and creativity with office workers, typically, right? And uh, Alan's done a lot of work on programming by demonstration, uh, which is uh, what their talk today is going to focus on. They're going to be talking about a system called Koala, uh, which is for enabling end-user programming on the web. And hopefully we'll be able to get the, uh, the internet sorted out here in just a second, and then we'll get to see that. And it's not sorting. Let's, uh, Do you need to borrow a computer? <coughs> well, I was that has the on for. successfully upstairs. Exactly. So. Let me try disconnecting and reconnecting. You try a wired connection, Ethernet in the back? Yeah, do you want to? We that could plug in a wire. may or may not work. I oh. kind of doubt it. These, these gentlemen up here might know. You want to come up here? Because I have no experience in dealing with this. You'd have to hand the numbers in. Okay, well, I'm going to try reconnecting and okay. see if that works. <coughs> You didn't have any yeah. other administrative things to take care of. It. All right. Then. Do you have any jokes? <laughs> <laughs> we could open the floor up. Yeah. Did it work through the? Did the thing on the on mm -hmm. Firefox work? So, oh yeah. Because before you have yeah. to do that to get a that's right. That's right. DHP lease and stuff. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try a cipher. So the radio is definitely working. Cipher and IBM Almaden, right? Yep. All lowercase and no punctuation or anything. All right. Yeah, it worked, will, uh, it worked before. So. Yeah, it worked swell. And you definitely need uh, internet for the uh, presentation? Definitely. We need the uh, VPN for the presentation. All right. Does yours work, Tessa? Uh, it's still invalid. Hmm. Do you want to put in your. You, oh, I you don't have a guest one? No, I don't. Do you have um, a, hmm. I can create another one, though. If well, they need their laptop because they've got stuff on it. Can well, I'm going to start talking guest? about other things for a little bit. Yeah. Why don't I try typing in my passwords? Yeah. Seeing if it's like um, user error. Oh, yeah. True. That's, that's a good idea. Yours worked fine on your computer? Yeah, Jessica? it just did. You do know how to spell, right? Yeah. So then I was thinking maybe that there was a key, ca you know, a yeah. numeric lock on or something. There's not. So it did work on yours. Uh, I, would, I just typed mine in, and I haven't seen if it fit. Them. Oh, I see. Yeah. No. yeah. Okay. Well, the first part, I can give a bit of the talk without it. Okay. So. Well, I'll try and get. The so yeah, if we get maybe just get another fresh guest login, that might. All right. Help. I'll do that. Let's get started. Sorry about the delay. So I'm Alan Seifer, and this is Tessa Lau. And we started this Koala project earlier this year. And also working with us is 
Greg Little, who is a grad student now at MIT, and he worked with us over the summer, and he's the one who actually got all the programming working. And he also came up with a lot of the important new ideas that we have in the program. And then the other people on the list are all researchers at Almaden who have now joined the project with us. So in this talk, I'm going to cover these uh, five areas. I'm going to start off with an overview of end user programming. And then I'm going to give you the demo of Koala and show you what's different about it. And then I'm going to go into this area of social end user programming, which I think is really the most interesting thing about uh, using Koala. And then I'll talk a bit about programming by demonstration and finish with a topic of why does IBM care and sort of what are the things that you can do using Koala, what, we, what our hopes are for it. So uh, as my brief overview of end user programming, this phrase end users, what it, what it means is people who use computers just because they want to get something done. It doesn't, it means, it rules out people like us who are fanatically interested in computers per se for some reason and people who are professional programmers. So really when I use the phrase, to me what it means is non-programmers. So end user programming is a contradiction in terms. It's programming for non-programmers. And what, what that ends up meaning is finding easy techniques so that people who aren't programmers and who don't want to be programmers can get some of the power of programming in an easy, accessible way. And to date, there have been really three main approaches that people have used to try to get this power of programming to end users. These are scripting languages, macro recording, and programming by demonstration. And my preferences run in that order, as, as you'll soon find out. Uh, scripting languages, the first approach is saying, well, you know, you're not going to get the power of programming without doing programming. Kind of the same way, you know, words are very important. Uh, there's a reason that we use the English language instead of just pictures. And there's a lot of power that comes from the abstraction of using a rich vocabulary. And they're saying that people who do scripting languages say, you need to basically have a language, but we'll try to make that language easier for you. And the main technique that people have used to make programming languages either is they use a domain-specific vocabulary. So for instance, one scripting language that I worked with, there was a message window that would appear on the screen. And you could refer to it in the scripting language. You could say the location of the message box. And if you actually use the underlying Pascal program, you'd have to say global to local, message window, hat dot, port bits dot, and so on. So it does make it more accessible. But um, it still is a programming language. So there's a strict syntax and there's a strict vocabulary. You, can't, uh, you have to say hide the message box. If you try writing close the message box, you get an error. Um, when people talk about successful end user programming, I think the example that most people use is spreadsheets. And although that is legitimately true, I think it's really unfortunate because it can be very misleading. And I'd like to explain that. The, thing, the reason that spreadsheet programming works and that it's, it does count as an end user programming language is that all of the users of spreadsheets are nerds. So that's an unfair end user audience, right? You're talking about people. What they're doing is they're doing calculations on numbers. So for those people, if you say equals if left paren a1 greater than b1, well, that is actually accept acceptable in that domain because they're working with numeric comparisons and things like that. So it's true that in the domain where your end users are accountants, it's OK and successful to have a scripting language uh, like they have in spreadsheets. But you don't want to make the mistake and then say that that sort of language is in general an acceptable solution for typical end users, for a larger end user population. And even more particularly, this um, sort of statement that I have here at the bottom, and if you look at the highlighted area where you say things like original left bracket i plus plus right bracket dot index, that doesn't count as acceptable end user programming language for people who aren't programmers. 
So the second approach that people have used for end user programming is called macros or macro recording. And my favorite version of that is I have a quick keys program that I use both on my Mac at home and on my PC. There are two completely different programs that they've written for the two platforms and they work fairly well. And what a macro recorder does is it basically says, you turn on a, this recording mechanism and we'll record every single mouse click you make and every key press you do. And then you can save off that recording and play it back and that will automate some sequences of actions. So in fact, I did use a macro when I was uh, preparing these slides because I copied over a bunch of slides from a previous presentation. And unfortunately, as in this example, all the text was in blue and I wanted all of the body text to be white. So I recorded the sequence that you can see right here and let me step through it and show you what I did. So you see the first step was a mouse click. What I did is I clicked here. Whoops, I forgot I have to get back in the... Okay, so the first thing I did was I clicked here and that selected the text area. Then I typed, you see the number two step, I typed a control A which selected all of the text. And then the third mouse click, I did a right click and then I wanted to pick the font menu so I typed the key F. And then you see it waits for the window font to appear. And then I did a mouse click on the word regular because I wanted to make sure it was going to be regular. Then the next mouse click was over here on this drop arrow for the color. And then by doing a down keystroke, it selected the white color. And then I pressed the enter key to say OK to that. And then I pressed the enter key for OK. And then I clicked up here to get rid of the selection and see all the text had turned to white. Okay? So let me just undo that. But that was the sequence that I recorded. Okay? And then I assigned it to a hot key. So I used control slash. So now as you watch, I'm going to press the control slash key. And you'll see it quickly executes that macro and performs all those actions for me. So that's what macro recording is. And that is, you know, that's a nice example. That's a good, it's a useful tool. And I do use it quite a bit. So now we get to the version of end user programming that I favor. And this is programming by demonstration. And the idea behind programming by demonstration is it's really smart macros. The trouble with macros is every single keystroke, every single click has to be the same. And so often the sequence of things you want to do is a bit more general or abstract than that. You can't get away with just the very laborious exact uh, recordings. And the idea behind programming by demonstration is this belief that if you know how to perform an activity yourself, if you can sit there and do it on the computer yourself, that should be pretty close to being a program. And why should you have to know how to convert that into this very abstruse vocabulary of a programming language? So the idea is that you give a few examples of what you want to do, just performing the activity, and let the system figure out and infer the abstractions and write the program for you. And to give you an, an idea of this, on the left here, you'll see a scripting language version of a train set, where there's got a train that runs around on pieces of track. And you see that doesn't look at all like, you can't really tell that anything is going on about trains and pieces of track there. And in contrast, uh, we made a PBD, Programming by Demonstration System, where the way you created the rules is you demonstrated what you wanted to do. So to teach a train how to move forward on track, you would, you would make a rule where you had the train sitting on a piece of straight track, and there was a piece of straight track to the right of it, and you recorded grabbing the train and moving it from the one square to the other square. And that made a rule that says, if, if I'm facing right and I'm on straight track and there's straight track in front of me, move on to it. And so by making, low well, 16 rules like that, I think you get a train that would run all the way around the track. And maybe you'd like it to have it before rules or so, but whatever, to my mind, making rules like that is a much better way for an end user to create a program than to write all of that text. So as I've said, it's a smart macro recording. And the difficult thing, which we'll get to a little bit more later, is that when a user performs an action, you have to figure out what it meant. Because in fact, 
you know, as people, we're pretty smart when we watch a demonstration. We kind of know because we know a lot about the context and, you know, common sense knowledge about what people do, we can make the right inferences. And for computers, it's harder. But the basic idea is to make those inferences and um, keep the user from having to do all that writing themselves. And the way that programming by demonstration really works, and the reason it can be successful, is you give it several examples to work from, and it has some domain knowledge. And there's this other problem that comes up in programming by demonstration, which is presenting the programming to the user. Um, I won't go into that too much now. OK, so that's the overview of end user programming. Now I'd like to talk about how it's been applied to date for programming on the web. And there's two uh, interesting scripting languages I want to talk about, uh, Grease Monkey and Chicken Foot. And then there's a macro recorder system called Platypus. And then finally, I'm going to talk about how Koala extends those systems by using programming by demonstration. So to start with Grease Monkey, Grease Monkey is a really interesting language that opened up uh, scripting and programming in a web browser. And what they did is to use the JavaScript language and let you use write JavaScript so you can modify the web page that's in your browser. So you get a regular web page that comes down from the web, and then you get to write JavaScript to mess with it and customize it and, and make it do what you want it to do. And one of the neatest examples of that is a program called BookBurrow. And what it does is any time you go to a web page that's, sell, that's selling a book, it pops up, you can see there in the corner, it pops up a list of other books, book sites that sell that book, and it gives you the, the price that they sell it at. So you can do instant comparison shopping on any site. Now, a small amount of the JavaScript code to make that work is over here on the right. And again, it's clear you're not going to call this an end user programming language. Because if you look at that um, highlighted region, region there, any language where you write left paren ampersand vertical bar backslash question mark, that actually doesn't count as legitimate end user programming. Okay. So the language is JavaScript, and that's quite a misnomer. It has nothing to do with Java, and it's not at all a scripting language. It's a full featured programming language. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's been very effective in this. It's just it's not end user programming, but it, this really is a wonderful tool for programmers to modify uh, web pages on their own machine. So the next step from this was a program called Chickenfoot, which really is, this is a really good example of a scripting language. And it meets all those qualifications of what you try to do when you make a simplified language that has a specialized vocabulary for the domain you're in. So if you look on the left here for Google search, this is a script in Chickenfoot. You can say go google.com. Enter WIS 2005, click Google search. And what's particularly interesting about it, and what is the real innovation, is for that command, click Google search. Now, Google search, those are words that appear graphically on the page that the end user can see. If you look at the HTML code for that button, the name of that button is actually BTNG. But you, as an end user, don't see that, and you don't have to know it. You get to use the words on the screen. And they'll even do things like if, if there's a label that's next to, adjacent to a box or something, they'll guess that the user is going to use that label to refer to the box. So it really is an innovative system. And it, to, me, to my mind, these are wonderful things about making advances so that end users who are non-programmers can start to do some sort of programming without having to learn a real programming language. Now, it is actually you know, a fairly complicated language. If you look at this example script on the right for finding a book, again, here part of it is there's an expression where you put left paren backslash d plus right paren. You know, so it's, it does have some of that in there. But still, the fact that it has these words pick, enter, click, and so on, it really is a big improvement over pure JavaScript. But another, the next sort of leap forward in end user programming is this program called Platypus. Now, Platypus is interesting because it's an extension written to the Grease Monkey extension to Firefox. So somebody may want to write extensions to Platypus next. I don't know. But the idea here was, this really is, to my mind, the first system 
that I would say is legitimately an end user system. So what these people did is they said, look, one of the things that people love about Grease Monkey is that you can take a web page and you can throw away elements of it that you don't want, such as ads on the page. And so they made a very nice tool that handles just a very small subdomain of what Grease Monkey can do. Just that small part of getting rid of parts of a page that you don't want. And they made that a really nice, easy to use interface for that. So when you use Platypus, it brings up this toolbar where you have um, just a few buttons for the different commands. So the commands you can use are cut, paste, isolate, erase, remove, things like that. And what happens is, as you move, I, here is an example where I clicked on the remove operation. And now, as you move your mouse around on the screen, it dynamically is highlighting in that uh, pink, pink color there, it highlights the different areas on the web page. So at that moment right there, it's highlighting that whole box of all of the traffic information about the Marin and North Bay area. So I used Platypus to remove all the areas I didn't care about. I don't care about traffic in the North Bay. I removed everything. I removed that uh, nav bar on the left, the video on the right. And I was left with just what I care about. This is my traffic custom page. This is my custom traffic page. Since I live in Santa Cruz and I drive through the South Bay, the only traffic I care about is those two sections. So this was perfect for me. It was very easy to use. And it really is something that an end user can do without knowing any programming. The unfortunate thing about it is it doesn't work very well. So the first time I used it, I got that. Uh, and the reason is, the way it works is it uses fixed XPath expressions. So it converted my actions into that. And that XPath expression of using div1 slash a it turns out that's not the right way to refer to Santa Cruz uh, because they change their numbering dynamically. And so it ends up getting the wrong areas. So the great thing about Platypus is it's direct manipulation. It's something that real end users can do. It gives them some of the power of programming in a limited domain. But the bad thing is it, you know, it doesn't work that well. So the idea behind Koala is to take that approach but actually make it work well. And the way we actually make things work well is by using programming by demonstration to be smart about making inferences to understand that we want some way to reliably refer to the code for Santa Cruz as opposed to a particular div number. And the other important part of what we're doing in this effort is we want to make end user programming social. So now I'm done with that introduction part. And if I can get an internet connection, I'll actually demo this. Set up another guest account. OK, let's try that. So it's the same password, IBM and the username is Koala, all lowercase. So Just a second here, let's see. So the username is? Koala. All of these. Yep. And then the password is the same thing. IBM. Hey. Yes. All right. OK. I That's think, good news. I think it will work from here. All right. Thank you. So I have to get on our VPN at IBM to use this, and it worked. Okay. Very good, thank you. Okay, so here's the uh, Koala website, and we have a list of scripts that people have made recently to do various activities. And I'm going to start off by showing you how we make one of those. So if I uh, open up the Koala sidebar, here's our Koala program. And I'm going to click on this to make a new script. So I'm going to record a script. And the one I'm going to record is 
let's say I'm interested in buying a house in Palo Alto and I'd like to see what's available now. Well, someone pointed me to a nice website at MLS listings and if you'll notice what happened there when I clicked that it recorded over here go to the website that I had picked. Okay? And um, I'm interested in Palo Alto so I'm going to type in 94301 and if you look over here, it records enter 94301 into the search by zip code text box. So now you'll notice right away that this is different from that macro recorder. It didn't say click at 124,484, right? It actually knew in the domain terms of a web program that it entered those digits into what it called the search by zip code text box. Now again, this is using the idea that Chickenfoot came up with, which is this text box is not in any way called with zip code anything. But we notice that on the screen there's this text search by zip code which appears next to it. And so we infer that that's a good way to refer to that box. Okay? And now I'm going to click the continue button. And this is interesting to see what gets recorded here. As you see, there's four of them. What we record is click the second continue button. Okay? And now here it says residential property. That's what I want, so I'm going to just click continue. And that gets recorded. And now on this page, you know, I have a very limited budget, unfortunately. So I'm going to look for houses a million dollars or under. <laughs> so I'll click here and put in, OK. So now it's recorded, put 1,000. You see, it calls it the two text box. Here it says from any to this. So we get, you know, that's its best guess at what to call this box. And let's just look for two bedrooms and number of properties per page. I guess I'd like to see 20. OK, so recorded, turn on the two bedrooms radio, radio and select 20 from the number of properties. Okay, So you can see this is not your typical macro recorder. It's doing a better job at figuring out what, how to refer to all these different items. So now let's begin our search. And uh, hmm, no matches were found. So turns out that you know a million just isn't what it used to be. Uh, so I guess in the future, let me come in here and edit my script. And I guess I'll have to save a little more. I'll go for two million. Okay, I think that'll be better. And now the interesting thing about this language I'm going to talk to you about a bit more is this is the recorded version. So this stuff we know works. But the whole idea behind Koala, and this gets into our notion of social programming, is you should be able to type anything reasonable. Okay? And when you read a script like that, it gives you a good idea of the sort of things that we can recognize. But we want to be able to recognize anything normal. If you say close or hide, that should all work. So for example, this enter 94301 into the search by zip code text box. It would be reasonable, I would think, to say something like put 94301 into the zip code box. Okay, so let's say that we did that instead. Right. So let me, okay, so here's our script. I'm going to save off this script and let me call it. Um, Houses in Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. okay. And now I'm going to save, save off this script. Now, an interesting thing we did, and it's still too early to tell, but when you save a script, your script is immediately saved on our Koala wiki site for everyone to see and use. And it's a wiki, so anyone can see it and change it. Now, it's an interesting social experiment because some people, you know, might not want others to see theirs, but we're trying to get into the idea of using of what wikis are meant to be and, you know, whatever you do, you're sharing it right away. And we're going to have different reputation systems and stuff so that people can rate it and say whether they like it or hate it. Anybody can change it if they want to, and we're gonna, we just want to see what happens with that. But now that we've recorded a script, let's use the play button. Because now I want to check on, first of all, I've made the change to 2 million. And isn't it nice that I don't have to redo every step just to change it to 2 million? So let's run that. I'm just going to run it and see what happens. 
So that's certainly a lot better than doing it by hand. And look, there's four available. So if you, <laughs> if you got two million and, and you act quickly, because you see uh, this one here is sales pending. So there's really three, but you, know, you might be able to get your, yourself a house in Palo Alto. And if you, none of these quite work for you, then you know tomorrow you're going to want to look again. And if you didn't have Koala tomorrow, you would have to come back to the MLS listing site and say 94301 and two bedrooms and you know, it's just really not that great. And here you just click a button and you're done. Uh, did, was that a question or no? How, how about debugging? I mean, what if, what if it breaks at the point where you've changed zip code? Yeah, OK, let me talk about that just a little bit. So um, let's go back to this line here and I'm going to just step to that, OK? Now, suppose I call this, let me edit this. And I wanted to say, suppose what I had instead was put 94301 into the, uh, let, me say, let me say something bad, let's call it the continue box or something like that, OK? What you could do, and uh, um, we're going to, right now this is sort of awkward when you go back and forth between editing. We're going to fix that up soon. But uh, that, that aside, here's what you can do. You can click on any instruction. Look, it got it anyway. Um, you can, oh no, it did, it put in the wrong one, right. So um, you can click on any line and see how it gets interpreted, right. And then if you don't like the way it gets interpreted, then you can try to fix it up. Or if it doesn't work, what I would always recommend is just go into record mode and have it record it, because it always records something that does. But that, that's the basic idea. You get to fool around with it and see what it'll do. And also, it's turned out that I've used it very often. When I'm running somebody else's script, every so often there will come to a statement that I don't want it to do. And you can just skip over by clicking there and have it. And then you do the thing you want yourself and then have a trip. And then also, when you're recording, you can turn the record button on and off so you can pick what you want to record. Yeah. Excuse me, you said that anybody can go and change code. Can you go back to your original code? Uh, yeah. code? So all of those issues we handle by using the wiki paradigm, which is in a wiki, whenever a change is made, the old version is saved. Okay. So you never really lose anything. And I believe we are going to add a version so that you can save some scripts locally. Um, but we, we're trying to push as much as we can the social idea. One reason I want to save them locally is I was uh, recently on a trip and I was in the airport and I wanted to connect to the local, uh, local uh, wireless network. And I couldn't because you have to be connected to get the scripts from Koala. And I wanted to run this script to get connected. So uh, there are reasons to keep your scripts local. Uh, but I think we will do that a bit. But it really is the social issue. Yeah. Can you, or maybe you're looking into the future, that instead of typing Palo Alto, it would execute a query of what Palo Alto zip codes and pull up all the zip codes for Palo Alto. Very nice. Let me show you something similar to that that we are doing. But that's that's a good idea. We aren't doing exactly that, but that does bring up a neat a neat point. Uh, in the back. So in your example, you went to a page and there were four items. So part one of my question is, can you actually pull content out of the page? For instance, the address or the price. Um, and the second question, so kind of returning a function of values. And the second is, could you then compose uh, other scripts that you've previously cast so that way the values from the addresses from this script could feed into a map or something? Cool. Like, so could we do mashups and things like that? Um, the best answer to that is there's a program out there called Clip Connect Clone, and I have a reference to it at the end that I'll show you that does exactly that. And I think they do a pretty nice job of that. Um, and another answer is the way we do things is, yes, we could. Because what we are going to do to get our programming by demonstration system to work is we record the entire DOM of each page as we record the action. So all that information is available. And it's up to you to write the intelligent inference system to make use of the data that's there. Yeah. Yes? Supposing you have a, a web page that requires you to fill out a bunch of fields and maybe a of pages. At the end of that, it constructs uh, you know, a, a get request and sends it to the server. But that get request includes all the values that you've been filling out here. Right. And it would be nice if, if Koala could realize that, oh, this thing has produced a get request with my values in it. Instead of having to 
go through each of these pages the next time they run this program? Can I just take the values and uh, yeah. turn it into a get request? That's, that's, a, that's a neat idea. Um, that's not the kind of stuff that I do. Um, when I do programming by demonstration, my approach is to record what the user does and then replay that. But your idea is smarter, and that would be a better thing to do. So I would think that would be a neat research project, is to do things like that, where you could uh, figure out at a higher level what's going on and doing something smart. And that would be nice, because then you could create scripts that really went beyond the UI, and you could do stuff completely in the background and do it faster and more efficiently and things like that. The one reason that I do want to know that you're putting together items that are going to be part of a, a post is because I want to be able to detect if I get another example and you do it out of order, I want to be able to detect that you're doing the same thing. Because the order doesn't make any difference when you fill in items on a page. So I want to have the smarts that will detect that and I'll see there's a pattern even though you change the order. But your idea of having a higher level process that understands a pattern like that and does it more efficiently, that's, that's neat. That would be nice. Well, you said the order on the page doesn't matter, but sometimes pages are dynamic and things appear and disappear. So Absolutely. There can be cases where that's that right. doesn't matter. And that's why I prefer to stick to an approach of I just record what the user did. Um, yeah, especially if you have Ajax and there's fields that appear on the page that weren't there a moment ago, you'll have to do it in that order. Yeah. Yes. Wired for this to work properly because if you have a page that changes from execution to execution, um, th does it seem that maybe embodying content that's going back and forth and then creating a custom user interface that's consistent is, is an alternative? Again, I think that's a good research idea. Um, I, I think there's something interesting there that you could do, especially when you make a, if you made it easy for people to create their own custom interface that was consistent for them, uh, that, that's an interesting idea. Uh, but I think we're actually going to be pretty ro robust in the face of the natural changes that webmasters make to their websites because they don't want to confuse their users either. And so even if they move things around on the screen, if, the, if it has the same label, if they refer to that button in the same way, it won't make any difference. And if they change the name a little bit but leave the format the same, again, those are things that we could detect. How about the Turing test type problems where they put a enter the WXQZ3 text <laughs> at the bottom of the screen? I mean, you've surely seen those uh, to prevent automated systems from it. Well, now that's an interesting point, too, like preventing automated systems. The question is, is the web community going to embrace things like Koala, or are they going to fight it? Right? And then the same issue is happening with mashups. You know, if we get away so that we can do web scraping and we can automate queries to your site, it might be that people will love that because their site's being used more. It might be that they'll hate it because now people aren't seeing the advertisements. That are, but you know, that's coming up anyway. So that's, I think that is going to be an interesting issue. Yeah. So I can see this being really useful when you have attributes that are simple, like lists, strings, things like that. But there are a lot of people have touched on this as the next evolution. When you want to do more complicated things like joining lists, one thing with another thing, which is you know a mashup, or when you want to sort of have a sub procedure that sort of fetches a piece of information and brings it back, like Palo Alto to its own code, um, you're getting to areas where we as programmers we want to do that kind of stuff all the time, mm -hmm. and of course, end users probably want to do that, but they don't know what that is called, like a sub procedure or a, right. or join or something like that. Right. So do you know how to do sort of like this programming by demonstration, but have it learn this kind of moving <coughs> behavior or joining behavior or? Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's really neat. Because what do you, I mean, that really is why programming by demonstration is a neat research area. And that stuff isn't all done. But um, one thing that has been done in the research so far, and that we're just going to apply, is fairly good work on text patterns and all that. So there's already fairly good inference algorithms that will figure out the pattern. When you picked out a certain word, and then you picked another one, and you, you joined them, there are pretty good programs. You know, th there's pretty good work already in that. But it's certainly an open area. And the smarter you can get, the better. Um, and again, this Clip Connect clone is much more concerned about creating new pages. What I'm concerned with in the Koala project right now is just 
making a reliable system that will redo what a person did in a generalized fashion. Uh, but this huge area of creating new interfaces using it, uh, the sky's the limit on that. But that's, that, that is getting hard, because you're trying to create a whole development environment. And that's, that's asking a lot more. But I think it's a great research area. When you're trying to learn something, when, when are the parameters you're trying to learn? Like, <clears throat> the parameters are sort of put in quotes, like 2,000 yeah. is a parameter because yeah. that's the thing that the user entered. Those are all things that are easy to infer because the user it came directly from the user. Yeah. But there are other things, like the higher level things that you're trying to infer, right. like the looping behavior. That's right. So, so I should get, let me, let me go on and give a few more examples. Because, but that is, that's what program by demonstration is about, is figuring out the higher level stuff, like looping and understand that and trying to understand abstractions from the examples. This example is very concrete. Uh, and programming demonstration does try to understand much higher level patterns than that. So let me give you a couple more examples and we can continue talking. OK, so um, the next example I want to give, let's see here. Um, oh, yeah, I, th I think I want to show you this one. Here's a script that I wrote called Forward All Call. So at IBM, we have these um, Cisco IP phones, which is very nice because there's a web interface so that you can uh, have an interface to your phone just from the web. And the main way I use that is on Fridays, I work at home, and I can run this script on the web page to forward all the calls from my work phone to my home. Okay. So here's the script that does that. And I'm gonna, I just want to show you one feature of it. So I'm going to stop it, hopefully. Uh, before it gets to the end. Unfortunately, this, it, it's kind of nice. This website's very slow, so uh, I'll probably get a chance to stop it without any trouble. So here it's going to go to the page, which is the Cisco interface to the phone. Oh, um, my fault. I've actually, I'm now running this program in demo mode and I've never entered it from here. So hopefully I'll remember what my password is. Huh. Um. So I, I don't think I'm going to remember it. So let me go just run another version of this program. Sorry about that. The demo, I made this special demo mode so that it would be, so that all the demos would go flawlessly. And it uh, <laughs> didn't exactly work that way. OK, so here's my forward all calls. Uh, that's a very, it's a very big issue. So for example, when, when these security dialogues come up, I'm still debating over whether I should override them and, let you, and record clicking OK. Because right? that would be a way that people could then make scripts that if you just, somebody, you just ran somebody else's, it might click OK. And it could be bad. Uh, well, like for example, SSH doesn't allow a command line argument that enables auto login. Right. Even embedded in a script or otherwise, you always have to type in the password. No. So I, I don't know if we want to, I don't know what we want to do there. Okay, so now this is going through the functions on the site to forward calls to another number. And, okay, let me step to that. Because here's the part that I want to show you in three more lines. And yeah, see this website. So this is, I'm so happy that I automated this because I used to sit there waiting for this web page to come back. And now I just click, okay, to do it, and then I'm done. Okay, so now it's going to forward all calls, but um, to this number. And now see the next line? Let me record the next line for you because I think that's worth um, showing you. So this, web, this website, you put in, you say you're going to forward all calls, and then you put in the phone number you want it forward to. So I put in my home phone number, OK? And so let me record doing that. Um, what you actually have to put in, oh yeah, let me just record it, is you put in 
nine to get the outside line at work, and then a one, and then my phone number is this. It says 831-662-3632, okay? 3632, okay? And look at how it recorded it. So this is something different that I haven't shown you before. It recorded it not as enter 918, which is what you expect. It recorded enter your home phone digits into the this number text box. Now, the reason it did that is because we have this personal data for Koala. Okay? And what personal data is, you get to make up any name you want for something. So like I made up this name, uh, home phone digits, down here someplace. There, home phone digits equals all those digits. Okay? And the reason I did that is so that when I run this and I stick in that number, it says, oh, those are the home phone digits. And it's auto-created a variable for me. And the reason I wanted to do that is I know that other people are going to want to use this script. And when they run it, they'll want to put in their phone numbers. Now, one solution would be that everybody could make their copy of this script and type in their own home phone digits there. But the whole idea behind this is to make scripts that we're sharing. So in order to make sharing work, it was important that we had a mechanism so that we could put in variables for the common personal data so that everybody can use the same script. And when it runs there, instead of putting in Tessa, it'll put in Alan. It'll do everything correctly. Because if we didn't do that, this sharing of scripts would have failed on day one. You know, if you have to go through the effort of changing the value of, of uh, your first name and your last name for the script, it's not even worth your, your time doing it. You might as well just do the whole activity yourself. So um, that's, that's what this feature is here. And I, it's going to, I think, be pretty important to us. But we'll, we'll see how it develops. And um, we also have another tab here of Blue Pages data. So at IBM, they have a um, website called Blue Pages that has all of the employee you know, standard information about every employee. So it has things like your first and last name and your phone number and your office location and all that. So if you're creating a script, and I fill in B2-422, it'll know that's my office number. And then anybody else who runs it, it'll fill in their office number there, too. OK, that's, that's what I wanted to show you there. So um, those are the main things I wanted to show you about Koala. Um, should I take a few more questions, or I've got a bit more of the talk? Well, we're getting close to the end. Uh, you have a question there. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, in the form, does it require the actual label element to create the association of the DOM, or is it doing some kind of heuristic checking? It's using all sorts of heuristics. OK. But um, the heuristics are based around things that a person would see. So because we, in this issue I brought up about in programming by demonstration, part of the problem, even if you create a correct program, you have to show it to the user in a way that they'll trust it. So that's why we use labels that appear on the page. And it's also why when you click on something over here, it highlights it over there so you'll see what it's going to do. And that's to reinforce you. This is a way of presenting the program to you, let you know what will actually happen. Yeah. The other question was, how does it deal with Ajax, where you've got dynamic changes without the, the, the post or get? Um, right now, it does miserably simply because we don't have it wait. As soon as we get it to the wait for the Ajax part, it's fine. Because it looks at the current DOM, and it parses it, and it doesn't make any difference. We just, I just haven't quite done the debugging yet to have it wait long enough for the uh, Ajax to have loaded. But outside of that, it works fine. Yeah. Wouldn't you have to actually have it um, reparse the DOM and you get the Ajax response? Yes, that's right. And that's no problem. Yeah. Uh, what about application as a software test tool? Very, a couple people have mentioned it to us. And my guess is it'll be very effective. And we're, we're going to talk to some people about doing that. And if you'd like to come up afterwards and talk to us, I, I think that sounds like a very interesting application area. So we want to pursue it. And I think it'll work well, because as I was saying, even if the UI designer moves the elements around on the page, we'll probably be able to find the same thing. And it'll, it'll be pretty robust, is my guess. Yeah. Have you looked much at the security issues? For example, people injecting stuff into your own scripts, and you don't realize your own script has been changed. Um, the question is about security issues. And we haven't looked into it too much. So the first place this came up was with Grease Monkey. And they did have a very bad uh, cross-site cross scripting, cross scripting uh, problem that they've now fixed by being a lot more careful about how they do it. Um, that issue has been looked into. In terms of our code, um, 
and somebody giving you a script that just does all sorts of bad things, we've got a couple things in our favor. The first is the script is, is here. Oh, so there is nothing beyond this. There's nothing hidden right now. All of our scripts are just plain text. And everything you see that what you see is what you get. So those are the commands that are going to be executed. And if you step through, as I say, each line will highlight. It'll show what it's going to do on the page. Uh, but I think there is still a, a very big worry that if this becomes popular and lots of people who are non-programmers download these scripts, you download it and you run it and you don't look at all and it ends up uh, stealing personal data or doing bad things on your machine. I think, I think it is a real issue and we haven't looked into that much. And I'd be glad to have people work on that. I think it's a real issue. A social issue as much as a technological one is that you're handing a programming tool to somebody who doesn't have the either the mindset or the training That's right. to understand what's going on. That's right. I'm thinking you've got personal data embedded, and most of the time people naively think, OK, well, presumably they need this. So <laughs> the password, and in goes the whole phone right. address. And the next thing right. they have to run a script submitting this information to a malicious right. person. I think, that's, I think that's a real concern. As you say, you know, it's a social issue, too. Yes? In terms of the usage model, how important is the wiki? It seems to me how like. What? In terms of the usage model, how important is the wiki? It yeah, seems why, to me. Tessa, like, why, don't you, why don't you answer it? Do you have a mic there? Uh, would you like to finish your question? Well, it seems to me that we talk, you talked about end users not being programmers, and a wiki user is a certain type of user, and a lot of users are not wiki people. So does this system, could this be marketed without the wiki, I guess? Yeah, how important is the wiki? Well, it's, it's, it's an ongoing experiment. We don't really know how important it is yet. Uh, my theory is that what the wiki is good for, it's really about getting people to share knowledge. And so a lot of the previous programming by demonstration systems that Alan was talking about before are really single user systems. You record a macro or a script, you save it on your computer, and you run it for yourself. And what we're really trying to do with the wiki is make it so that the thing that you do for yourself can be used by other people as well. And you don't have to do the work of recording it yourself in order to get the benefit of automation and playing back some of this knowledge. Um, so we hope that the wiki is, is the, the catalyst to sort of draw people into the system and get them to use it and see how it can work for them. You're narrowing your user base to a certain type of user who's comfortable with wikis? It's, it's a danger. Um, you know, we're trying to make it as easy to use, so it's just like going to a website, right? People go to websites all the time. They don't necessarily know that, they don't necessarily need to know that they're using a wiki. What we want them to know is that they're going to the site where they could look for procedures and they could play them back. Um, so we want the wiki to be sort of integrated with the experience so that it isn't a, another hurdle that they have to learn, but it's just part of the system. But it's, it's definitely one of the concerns that we have going forward. Uh, can you turn the koala on itself in the sense that for example, in the wiki, since only the latest version is visible right away, and to get, and if, if I want to use an historical version from two weeks ago, I want to record that I actually go to the history page, I pick up a certain older version, and then I'm active, I'm always playing an older version of the script. Now, you may want another version, so we're actually using Koala to find out the right version of itself to actually use it. Uh, that's scary. Yeah, I think, I think you could. We are making it so that it's not quite working yet, but we'll have it so you can record all menu commands and everything in, in uh, Firefox. And anything that you could do by hand in Firefox, so if, if that procedure is something you could do by hand, we'll be able to record it and play because it back. Otherwise, somebody else asked if you want the original version. Mm -hmm. Well, the original version required quite a bit of backtracking to find out. Right. Yeah, so if you went to the wiki and you hit the button to get the history pay out of the wiki and then you went and you picked the first one and all that, that should be recordable. It seems like the obvious solution is to have a publish option for the social networking aspect. You, know, you come up with a script, you save it locally, it's secure, you've constructed it. And then when you're happy, you say publish mm -hmm. on the web. Other people can use it. I, I, I like this radical idea of having everything be public and if you do something special, it gets recorded on your local machine. We'll, we'll see how it plays out. Any, yeah? Do you, do you leverage the notion of context at all in the scripting language? So for instance, in one of your examples, you said click on the zip code for a uh, field, fill in the zip code field, and then click on the second continue button, which is probably global to the page. But someone, a webmaster might come in and add, there's so many of them, another continue button. 
wouldn't it be better to be able to say, you know, click on the continue button, and because contextually the last thing you did was the zip code, it would take the nearest one, for instance? Wow, that's neat. So I hadn't thought of that solution, and um, I'll go back tonight and put that one in. That's much better. Um, the one I had thought of and was working until I made an improvement last week is that I actually was able to find that continue button and it's in a table where the first column of the table had the word zip code. So I was able to label that as the zip code continue button. And I thought that was a good solution. But yours uh, is definitely better that it's the continue button next to the thing you just typed into and that's the one you should use. So that's a much better heuristic. That's good. And, and some of its heuristics does use oh. like physical location on the page right. and proximity as right. some of its right. input metrics. Right. But, but using the fact that it was where I just next to where I just typed text, that's very good. Yeah. I just want to point out that we do have to two o'clock, so if you have more stuff, we'd be happy to see that. Okay. And uh, I also wanted to kind of follow up with a. So, um, one of the things that I use Grease Monkey for is for actually doing things like oh, when I hit D, so it should delete in Gmail. So do you, have, do you have any intention of doing something like that in terms of actually being able to capture events um, and be something event-based? Or uh, two answers to that. One, I think, is like the other question of can you have sort of a higher level processing where you understand what's happening beneath the scenes and be smart that way? Um, the second answer is that I haven't talked anything about triggers yet. So the, once we've recorded one of these scripts, the only way we can trigger it now is you can put it in your toolbar menu items and then select that, that menu item and that runs it. But what we definitely want to do is, and something that Chickenfoot does nicely and Grease Monkey is, actually insert it into the page so that um, when I go to Amazon.com that there will be a button that I can click on that says, you know, run this script now or... Um, so things like that. And we also want to have, whenever you go to a page, we'll show you that there's 12 scripts that other people have written that apply to the page you're on now. And so we're looking at different ways to trigger it, and we haven't, haven't done that yet. Is that something you're going to put out, kind of like Grease Monkey or um, Chicken You know, where we are. So, you know, this is done through IBM research, and so some of it is going to be proprietary technology, I guess, but that's sort of up to the business people who decide that. But we already do have permission that at least the macro recording part of this, uh, we're going to release as open source, free open source code as an extension. So that at least anybody who wants to do research in, in programming by demonstration, they won't have to go through their tr the trouble of duplicating all this, getting it to record well. So at least that, the, the recording part, of if we come up with some really clever AI algorithms for, and heuristics for interpreting it, um, who knows what IBM will do with those. But at least, yeah, at least the basic core of it, we want to get out there so that people can use it. Has this been an extra project, or will it be? Uh, <laughs> uh, it hasn't been. I mean, all of the stuff that you've seen here was developed by mostly me and Alan and our summer student, Greg Little. Uh, we're going to try to get an Extreme Blue project around this next summer, or this summer, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there, or are there any plans for conditional branching in scripts? Because if, if there's no new mail, then you wouldn't want to delete mail. And I'm, you know, you say I'm glad you. I'm sorry you asked that question. That's that's certainly one of the big issues, right? The conditionals and iteration, they're so essential to making any programming system that really works, right? So I've always tried up to this point to find some nice, elegant way to let people not worry about it, and I think now I'm finally tired enough that I think I have to admit we need to add some kind of explicit conditional structure to the program and hopefully do it in at least a way that will make it easier for people to use. But absolutely, conditionals and iteration, all those standard things exist. There's a real need and you won't be able to make the interesting programs that you want without having that. But it's, it still is a research area. There's no really great solution to that yet. It seems like some of the technologies you're showing, like the, the scripting within the browser and the sharing are generic software benefits that are applied to end user programming, but also possibly that programmers would be I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how to combine end user programming and programmer programming and how those might interplay. You wanna, wanna that? that's, that's, that's really neat. I, I haven't thought about that. Um, Greg Little, who worked with us, that actually his main interest, and I think probably what his thesis will be on, is 
making tools for, perfect, for real programmers. Um, so he would certainly, I can at least give you his contact information because I, I know he'd like to talk about that topic. That's, that's really neat. One of the ideas that I haven't shared with Alan yet <laughs> is um, giving uh, real programmers some kind of override system for the, uh, for the end user language. And so if you, if you know what you're doing, so for example, if you know that you want this particular XPath expression to refer to some element on your page and our heuristics aren't getting it right, maybe we can let you sort of drop down into that language and let you script it at that level um, just for that step so that you get all the benefits of Koala for the rest of your program. But if there's something that you know that you need to do some particular way, you can have that power. Oh, that's very neat. Does that open up the whole security can of worms once again, though, <laughs> allowing lower level access to a script that appears to be plain English? Right. Yeah, I think, that, I think security is going to be a, a big deal. But I don't think we'll use a Microsoft solution of just saying, oh, when you send your email, it's, there might be scripts. It's probably OK. Yeah, we, I think we have to be very explicit and careful about that. Any other questions? Well, I do have more slide stuff that I was, um, we sort of switched things around. We did all the questions during the talk <laughs> part. Do you, I, I could briefly go over some more stuff. Would you like me to do that? Or? OK, feel free to. Uh, to leave as, as you wish. But uh, first of all, thank you. This is always such a great audience. I really appreciate coming here and getting good questions from you. It's neat to get these questions we've never heard before. That's, that's wonderful. OK, let me sh give you a few more topics then. Oh, yeah, let me show you the video. OK, I mean, this is, this is the most important thing. All right. So the reason this came up is, um, one of the big topics, the reason IBM cares about this, is lots of big corporations are doing this thing. Well, in fact, the whole world is doing this thing, that they love to, to fire all the people who used to be experts in doing some given area and forcing end users to do it now. So when you go to make your travel reservations, you don't go to a travel expert anymore. You go to the website and do it yourself. And a lot of stuff comes up that you really, you're not an expert. You don't know about it, and it makes it really hard to do. And inside IBM, it's just miserable that if you try to order a product, you have to know all this information. The purchasing agents knew, and they've all been fired, and you have to figure it out yourself. And it's just awful. So I was using one of those sites, and I, had, I just started laughing because I had this insight that I had seen this before. And this is the part you can't show um, over the, uh, in the recording, but locally, I want you to see this, and then you'll know what I'm talking about. How come that didn't work? Keep up the bridge. Okay, so the reason I thought about that is I was filling out this form to, to buy a product, right? And they asked me, what is your name? And, you know, how many times have you put your name in the computer? And I had to put in my name. So wouldn't it be a lot better if the computer did the what is your name part, right? And it didn't actually ask me what is my quest, but it asks you know, a comparable thing. He says, what do you want to buy? And it's just the example of a question that that's the appropriate thing to ask a person. 
right? When I go there, you, you're not going to have to ask me and get a human to tell you what you're going to buy. Or you know, an another example is if you're doing a flight, do you want to go on a flight that leaves at some ridiculously early hour in the morning? Or would you prefer one that leaves at a nice time, but it has a three hour layover in Chicago? Right? Well, you just have to ask a person to answer that. You're not going to write a program for that. But then the third question, what is the airspeed of an unladen swallow? Well, that is what they asked me, because I'm trying to buy a computer monitor. And they asked me, uh, product category. Let's see, is that a net parts expense purchase from vendor? Or is that purchased and leased equipment PC workstation? They could have just as well have asked me for the uh, flight speed of an unladen swallow. I had no idea which of those it was. And this is an example where you need an expert. And no matter what we do, I don't think we're going to solve this. So inside a corporate setting where you're trying to make things easier, we can give you a system that handles the first two questions. But the third, you really need to have some way to get people to the expert that can answer them. So uh, in terms of the. I wanted to bring up this notion of mixed initiative systems, which is really important in end user programming. And really, the whole reason that end user programming works is if you get a system that has this nice mix between initiatives, the initiatives are the person taking the initiative or the computer taking the initiative. So you want to be able to go back, for, back and forth in a nice fluid way. So the, the computer handles the things that it can handle well. The person handles the things that they can handle well. And, uh, by doing that, you can make this imperfect programming, where I do a recording, but you know I can't get all the steps to work right. Instead of spending an hour and trying to figure out how to program that part, you can just leave it for later and say, well, well, I'll do that part myself, but let the computer do all the other steps for me. So it really makes practical this idea of doing an imperfect job of writing a program. And Alan Kay had this statement says, when a human is using a computer, there's one intelligence there, so you ought to take advantage of it. And that is the idea here. You know, you've got a person there, so use that intelligence to make this process work well. And Richard Potter came up with this very nice concept for end user programming, which he called just in time programming. And the idea is here you are, you've got a job you have to get done, and you know you, you're going to do this 20 times again in the next couple of years. Do you stop now and write the program? Or do you like, do the annoying stuff because you, you'll, you'll get it done in the next two and a half minutes, and that's better? So the idea is to have a system where, well, if you just record it, you'll get most of the way there with almost no extra investment in time. And then you can iteratively improve that as time goes on. So that re really is what makes end user programming a uh, practical matter. And then on this question of the uh, airspeed of an unladen swallow, I had one more example of this where I was filling out a web form to get a check for a conference fee because they didn't take credit cards. And I'd never done it before. And you know, they asked me the questions, what is your name, of course. Then they asked me, who is it for? Well, that's perfectly legitimate. And then they come to this innocuous question of what's the commodity code? Well, I had no idea what the commodity code was. And I ended up asking, as you can see from that subject line, I ended up asking seven people before I finally got to the person who actually was an expert and had the answer. Um, one of the things I found the most humorous is they actually had help built into the system. So when I asked for the help on the commodity code, this thing in blue, it says, it's the classification of the expense for this payment. And then they um, told me that these commodities are the same as the ECR categories that were available to you. <laughs> so they clearly weren't talking to me, because there were no ECR categories that were available to me. And the thing that was interesting to me about this, when I finally did get to the expert, she said, well, she was actually at home sick, and she didn't have her notes with her. So she referred it to her colleague in New York. So not only was the question hard for an expert, an expert couldn't even answer it without her notes. And normally, you know, IBM expected me to fill out the commodity code field. So I think this really is a huge issue that's going to come up a lot. Yeah. eBay has a bit of a similar problem. When people would say, I want to sell this, where do I sell it? And they have a very big, broad, and deep hierarchy. Right. And so they've actually given up mostly on the hierarchy. And they just say, type in what you want to sell. And we think these are the most relevant categories. Pick one of them. And if you're the expert user, then you can dig down on the category tree. That sounds like a pretty good solution, isn't it? Yeah. And for this case, I think maybe we'll be able to do something about when 
when people record this, like when I recorded this as a script and put it on the Koala site, I put in that if you're at Almaden, go to Lisa. You know, so that's a start. And maybe people will annotate that and say, well, if, any, if you're in New York, here's the email of that person. I, you know, maybe this will turn out to be a better solution. I don't know. But I see this as being one of the big issues that still has to be addressed. Uh, but why not, as part of being a social, record, uh, starting generating a database that in under certain conditions that are on you things, this is the answer that will save. So later, just like on Amazon, all the people who have those conditions use this particular code. So it will list the code that are similar to conditions. So whether or not you make flight or buy printers, you will see some kind of an, uh, human readable uh, association between codes and uh, uh, situations. Yeah. Yeah. I I think that's probably, again, it, that looks like research, but I think that's a good idea. OK, uh, let me see if I have some other hot topics to show you. Oh, I just wanted to mention that um, this idea of doing the sharing and collaborating really has been a large part of end user programming work since 93, when Bonnie Nardi wrote this really influential book called The Small Matter of Programming that's about end user programming. And she found that one of the critical, con she mainly was looking at why spreadsheets were so successful. And one of the things she found that was critical was that there was a supportive community there. So that anybody who was working on a spreadsheet knew the person down the hall who knew a little bit more about it. And they knew somebody that they could call who was a real expert geek at it and stuff. And it was that whole community of people at different levels that could support each other. Um, that really made it successful. So that's why I think having a community element, which is so much easier now that we have the web and that we have wikis, I think it's a really critical part of this. And by the way, I think it was her book. It may have been another place. There was a very neat result. Oh, actually, it was the buttons work, which was done at Europark, where people could do a little end user programming and make buttons to do a given activity. And they could actually send them an email to each other. And they found that if somebody who was a non-programmer took a button, where the code was all written in a code that they didn't know how to program. But if they changed just a little part of it, like changed the room number or the building number to their building number, afterwards they started referring to it as my button. So there's this real buy-in when you start tinkering a little bit. And I think it's, that's a wonderful thing that gets people in at the ground level to start doing some of this sharing and using of uh, end user scripts and, and supports the whole process of people working as a community. Yeah? Comment. Google had 943 hits on, on uh, commodity code and IBM. <laughs> <laughs> and did anyone, some say, random one from there. did anyone tell me that it was X07? <laughs> I don't know. I've <laughs> well, in, but you know, in fact, when I uh, was filling out the check request, it was for a professor at University of Oregon. And it was at 5 PM, and I needed to get the tax code for University of Oregon. She called around, couldn't find it. And then she finally says, oh, I, says, I got it. She says, I Googled it. And there, there I was, got it right away. So uh, yeah, that's a good solution, too. OK, let's see. No, no match. <laughs> All right. um, the one example I wanted to give, I wanted to give you a bunch of examples of why we need these multiple interpretations and why there's a lot of inferencing involved in uh, end user programming. So let me just give you this quick example. Um, I wanted to make a I'm feeling kind of lucky button, which you type something in and it takes you to the first five pages that match and puts them in tabs, right? Now. What I would like to do is then, if I used uh, Koala, I want it to record control click, the first link, second, third, fourth, fifth. But now when you look over here, you can all of a sudden you start seeing why people have to use real programs and why all these simplistic notions of, oh, just record it and play it back, it'll work. It's not going to work. Because if I use Koala, first of all, it would record control click the chicken foot link, or the first chicken foot link, and control click the chicken foot official website link, which is not what I want at all. Because when my next 
Query is not about chicken foot. Those are the wrong names. I wanted it to make the generalization. Don't click on the chicken foot link. Click on the first link. Well, first link? I bet the first link is actually images, right? I meant the first link in this section. And well, are you including the sponsored links? Well, I don't know, it, right? So you need some way to address all those questions. And that's what the whole research area about doing program by demonstration about is being smart so that you make inferences so that people can point you at things and you can figure out what they mean and come up with a robust way of explaining it without them having to learn how to write this in, in C. Because I know there'd be some way you could do it, but it'd be a lot of work. And I, th I am still very optimistic that by being given a couple of examples, you can do a very good job of answering those. And you just have to get the interface right so that people can use it and understand it. Since a lot of that, I'm looking specifically at that example that you were just talking about. Since a lot of what, a lot of what Paula is functioning on is on the website and you do have the DOM, could you use the same kind of metaphor that you kind of showed when you were showing the keys that you first need to select the text box? then you can do the selection. So can you do something along the lines of like, oh, first select this area of DOM, and then do something else? Absolutely. You could have the user constrain you to the right area of the DOM. But I'd like to even be a little More. freer than that. So that um, if so my guess is that if I recorded this example, and then I just recorded another example where I typed in a completely different word, it would have a different number of sponsored links, right? These would, some would be indented. It would come up with a very different page. But if I then did the control click on those five links, by looking at those two DOMs and trying to see what was similar in them, I bet, even which, from two examples, you could infer a very good program and you would know what the user meant. And that's what I see. That's the main approach used in program by demonstration. And I think it's going to be very, it's going to be effective. Depends on the server providing a standard DOM consistently in time and consistently across different servers. No, I, I don't think so. My my I think you have to apply it to intelligence to get it to work at all, and there will have to be some intelligence built in so that when you look at the new DOM and it's a little bit different from the ones you've seen before, that you'll you know you'll have to do a little thinking, but that you can write an AI program that'll be, you know, do roughly do the obvious things that a person would do when it had changed and try to figure out which parts really matched. And I think you can be pretty smart at it. So I, again, I'm, you know, like foolishly optimistic about a lot of these things. Okay. Anything else? I think that's, that's it then. Thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.